Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'd like to welcome everyone here this morning. Um, the uh, first thing we'd like to do here before we start our uh, start the meeting is we would ask everyone who are willing and able to stand uh, for invocation and then remain standing for a pledge of allegiance. Um, this morning, uh, <clears throat> R.E. Dean was supposed to have been here. He's a chaplain for Company One, and he's under the weather, so I'll be uh, filling in for him. If you would let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to this place today, Scripture tells us, for, two, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Father God, we know that you are always with us. We pray this morning that you would guide this board in all that we are tasked to do, and that you grant us knowledge, wisdom, and discernment. We pray that with your guidance, our intent will be true and our decisions just. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will continue to bless this board, the citizens of Culpeper County, our state, and our nation. These things we ask in your son, Jesus Christ's name, amen. I'd like to now call to order the April 2nd, 2024 AM Board of Supervisors meeting to order. And with that, I would ask Supervisor Durr to please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with Before we get going this morning, I have a couple things I'd like to bring, uh, bring up before we uh, get into the um, approval of the agenda. Um, as many of you know, today marks one week since the uh, catastrophic event in Baltimore, and that was at approximately 1 a.m. a cargo ship leaving the port of Baltimore struck the Francis Scott Key Bridge causing a devastating and catastrophic collapse. I would ask that we all keep the families of the deceased and missing in our thoughts and prayers and let us also pray for the safety of the salvage and cleanup crews and mindful of all those who are negatively impacted with this tragedy. I would like to highlight that if it were not for the heroic efforts of the first responders during that event, and that was the police officers who within two minutes notice stopped the traffic on that bridge, saving countless lives and uh, it could have been a whole lot worse. With that, six days prior to that event, Wednesday, March 20th, in Culpeper County, we had experienced the ideal conditions for fire that included high winds, low humidity. These wind gusts brought down trees, sparking fires throughout the county. In particular, the two largest fires were located at Scottsville Road, burning some 60 acres, and, and that was in the Jefferson area and Yaywood Drive and O'Bannon's Mill, which burned some 237 acres in the Boston area. This was the largest brush fire in recent history for Culpeper County. Again, we can all be thankful for the heroic actions of our local first responders. Through their dedication and commitment to others, not one home was lost, nor were there any serious injuries. And I would like to just point out each department from our, their E911 dispatch center for their uh, great efforts and how they orchestrated the radio traffic, to our volunteer fire departments from Company 1, Culpeper, Company 2, Brandy, Company 6, Richardsville, Company 8, Salem, Rapidan, Company 10, Reva, Company 16, the Culpeper Volunteer Rescue Squad, Company 11, our Culpeper Emergency Services, Company 12, our Culpeper Sheriff's Office, Culpeper Town Police, and the Department of Human Services. These people worked flawlessly together to achieve the best outcome possible. And with that said, I would like to commend and thank each and every one of you for a, a job well done, and you all make Culpeper proud, so thank you. With that, <clears throat> We will move on to the approval of the agenda. And if there are any additions or deletions to the agenda. Uh, yes, sir. I would ask that item 2.02E be removed from the consent agenda and placed as item 3.04. Mr. Chairman, I have an additional request. Uh, if it's the appropriate time to bring up a second. 
amendment, uh, I'd like to make an addition, potentially uh, item 5.03, which would be the consideration of the adoption of three resolutions in support of community funding requests. Additions or deletions to the agenda. Hearing none, um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Moving on to item 2.02, .02, our consent agenda, and I will turn this over to our county administrator to introduce these items. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, members of the board. Uh, this morning we have uh, four items on the consent agenda. Under item A, the board will consider approval of the minutes from the March 5th, 2024 a.m. and p.m. meetings. Under item B, the board will consider acceptance of a donation and a budget amendment in the amount of $1,000 for the Animal Services Department. LeBaron Rescue and Sanctuary donated the funds to be used for veterinary services. Under item C, the board will consider acceptance of a grant and appropriation of the funds in the <coughs> amount of $5,000. The funds were received for the Sheriff's Office from the Virginia State Police for the HEAT program. And under item D, the board will consider acceptance and appropriation of funds in the total amount of $42,025. These funds are comprised of multiple donations received by the library from various sources. Thank you, John. Move for approval of the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Moving on to item 3.0, uh, general county business. The first item, the board will receive an update regarding the Carver Food Enterprise Center. And again, we will turn this over to our uh, county administrator to introduce this item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We uh, had had a request from the uh, Food Enterprise Center to just come and give the board a brief update. And I believe there's a PowerPoint presentation uh, this morning. And are we ready for that? Uh, good morning, and thank you all for having me here today. Um, my name is Gretchen Ledmore, and I am the program director for the Carver Food Enterprise Center. Uh, my goal today is to give you an update on the progress of this project, which you all have been incredibly supportive of, and also to give a little peek be behind the curtain of all the wonderful things that we are doing there. Created in 2014, the George Washington Carver Agriculture Research Center has a mission to strengthen, sustain, and enhance agriculture in the environment in Virginia's northern Piedmont region. We're located in the old George Washington Carver Regional High School, which is now known as the Carver Center. As a project of the nonprofit, the Carver Food Enterprise Center provides services in three areas, economic development, job training, and food security. Beyond providing access to the commercial kitchen space, which is necessary for many small food businesses, the center soon provides technical assistance and, and co-packing services to farmers who want to expand into value-added production. And for folks who don't know what a value-added production is, that's like taking tomato and making tomato sauce, right? You add a value to a product. A 2015 economic analysis carried out by Ken Meter, who is one of the most experienced food analysts in the entire United States, determined that at the time, this region, which is rich in agricultural resources, is not reaping the economic benefits of its labor. He detailed that our local food economy is leaking over $550 million in potential wealth each year, with many folks consuming food from outside of the region, which is where we hopefully come in. Thanks to the generous support of Culpeper County, and other community partners, after eight years of planning and fundraising, the kitchen opened September 1st, 2023. So that was only six months ago. Our main kitchen offers users a 10 burner stove, oven, prep tables, lots of cold and dry storage, and an extensive commercial equipment library. These pieces of equipment are very expensive and usually outside of the normal price range for small business owners to meet. We opened two more spaces since then, a prep space that has clean, food-safe work tables and electricity, and a bakery with two full-size convection ovens. These spaces are available 24-7, 
at affordable rates with additional discounts to new businesses and food producers. We also plan to fundraise enough to cover the final cost of the rest of construction to complete the vision for the space by the end of 2025. This includes a co-packing, which is where we at the Carver Center will make the product from the produce. Co-packing is something that is highly requested by the local agricultural community. Most farmers just don't have the time to start a whole new business, to come up with the recipe, to come up with the staff for that, and to pull all the appropriate licensing and regulations that they need. Instead, co-packing would mean here at the Carver Kitchen, we would do whatever steps or all of those steps, and then the farmers would be able to buy back that product, label it, and resell it. Our biggest request right now is for bone broth. Local cattle producers are sending their bones out to West Virginia and Pennsylvania in order to get bone broth for distribution and retail sales. We have about eight farms who have requested this specific co-packing service with four determinedly following up all the time. <laughs> we have currently funded two necessary pieces of equipment to meet this demand, a steam kettle and a hood, and hope to begin our co-packing bone broth before the end of this year. The rest of the space will include a large processing area, more equipment, cold storage, shipping and receiving, and a classroom with offices. Currently, the kitchen has 11 regular kitchen users who have used over 300 hours of kitchen time. Two of our original users have moved on, with Jack Lake opening a brick and mortar in February, and the Turner Girls Catering securing a permanent venue, they got their keys yesterday, for a wedding and events. Out of the 11 current users, four are brand new businesses that could not have opened without access to the space. Additionally, we are in the process of helping five local farmers work on their Department of Agricultural certification for a value added product. We are also in the process of becoming certified to handle the bone broth, because it's a meat product, and oversee acidified foods, things like jams and jellies. Uh, production certification for these are, are very costly, ranging up to $500 per person, and you have to have somebody who's certified in order to make those products. By being a centralized location, the kitchen can increase the accessibility and profitability for our local farmers. Our biggest feedback so far has been how important the one-on-one -on -one instruction and guidance is when it comes to navigating the food regulatory landscape. Each, every single product has a different pathway. And Every step on that pathway is different depending on your size or where you plan to sell. And so it gets incredibly complicated and very difficult to navigate. We've tried to offer this broad class content and then followed up with specific focused coaching, which has worked pretty well. We have over 110 businesses contact us in September for advice or use of the potential kitchen space. There have been about 50 that have stopped by to visit the kitchen, and the Carver Center now regularly gets walk-ins who are looking for the kitchen space. To meet this rapidly increasing demand, Virginia State University has an MOU with extension for a new value-added agriculture extension agent position at the Carver Center. Once hired, this extension agent would be the second Virginia State University extension agent in the entire state, and they would be located in Culper Pepper specifically to help this project. But we don't just help food businesses. Since opening the kitchen, we have started running the Feeding 500 program. It's held at the kitchen, and these events transform really hard to use produce donations, such as like massive sweet potatoes that are the size of your head, or you know, 2,000 pounds butternut squash, um, <laughs> or rescue food for meals for local food pantries. We do this with volunteer support. We run three such events, rescuing well over 2,200 pounds, of produce that was headed for pig pens or trash cans and transforming it into over 2,000 healthy meals that are ready to eat. The key to doing so is that commercial grade equipment. Um, some of that stuff can process 1,000 pounds of produce in an hour. That's a, a huge time saving. It cuts down on potential spoiling and our goal is always to make something that's easy to eat and healthy with a super high nutritional content. Through our connections with MAFRAC, PAC, and the Blue Ridge Area Food Bank, we're notified directly when there's excess food. You know, we've been part of these organizations and they know what our mission is. And then we also get connected to additional ingredients that round out whatever we need to make the, the end result. Our goal is always for these meals to be prepared with as much rescued ingredients as possible. Our next venture is taking the knowledge that we've gained through these events and use it with Culpepper Free Clinic's Food Prescription Program 
So they're trying to offer a food pharmacy. So you know, if you get a diagnosis of diabetes rather than just getting drugs or pre-diabetic, you would also essentially get a food prescription to help you combat that and, and bring down your levels. And we're offering to be part of that program by offering meals that are ready to go. While these programs help our community, they also build our internal capacity. As mentioned previously, local farmers are eager for us to begin these co-packing services. Doing programs like Feeding 500 honestly just allow us to learn. We get the experience of using all this commercial grade equipment, of managing large groups of people, and just understanding how that workflow is. In addition to the Feeding 500 event, the kitchen runs several other programs aimed at economic development and strengthening our local food system. The Stone Soup Job Training Program is designed to provide training on food safety, customer service, and teach basic culinary skills with a focus on mentally and intellectually challenged individuals, getting them ready for employment in the food service industry. Additionally, the program is geared to helping participants care for themselves and their families. We're working to expand this program and offer it out to other populations, as well as have more equipment and processing skills that will enable any participants to be hired at a living wage by the Carver Food Enterprise Center for our co-packing. We also plan to help local schools use more local produce in their cafeterias. The Farm to School Associate for the RRC, Mallory Grady, noticed this last year that while several area schools are using more local produce, many of them have staff shortages in their cafeteria, make it really hard to process local food donations. We've applied for a federal grant with them, and it's aimed at bridging this gap where we would provide the processing and then send that to the schools to then have a quick cook. Fingers crossed we get it. We offer certifications and workshops regularly with trainings on how to safely handle and prepare food or learn how to navigate the regulatory system. Since opening, we've helped over 237 small businesses with our trainings, certifications, and paperwork, and that's just in six months. While some of the business plan, businesses do plan to use our services, many more are using our services to expand into whatever they see works best for them. Finally, our kitchen will host food preservation courses through its partnership with the Virginia Cooperative Extension with topics like canning, dehydrating, and freeze drying, which is very, very hot right now. Everybody wants to know how to do it. These classes will teach methods to extend the shelf life of meat and produce and help local farmers learn new ways to add value, increase sustainability, and income. Over the last year, GWC ARC has received $173,009 in funding to support the purchase of necessary equipment and community education and programming. Our funders include PATH Foundation, Northern Piedmont Community Foundation, Prince Charitable Trust, Walmart, Amazon, Likes Foundation, Farm Credit, Chesapeake Bay Trust, Virginia State University, Virginia Tech, and private donations from locals. We also have 284,685 in funding requests that are pending. The funding will support the development of the co-packing spaces and services, educational and community programs. We will continue to apply for local foundation grants as they become available, and we do have really great working relationships with all of our current funders. We are interested in potentially pursuing a community project funding request, which does look incredibly promising to finish off our classroom and our offices. These are the starting points for much of the incubation work as well as uh, the education and economic services that we provide, they're also going to be the most public facing of the space that we currently rent. We are applying for the Loeb grant and are looking forward to the local food promotion program, which is aimed at strengthening lo local food ecosystems. Most importantly, we've started our applications for two large grants that will help finish off all construction. <clears throat> While getting funding for our programs, equipment, and food system work has been relatively easy, finding construction funds has been significantly harder. There's just starting off not that many grants that fund construction. And then Culpeper County's ownership of the building, which is financially a huge boon to us, does make outside funders a bit more hesitant because they don't want to invest in property. However, the RFSI and the AFID grants are great matches for our organization and could provide the rest of the funding needed for construction. Additionally, we have been, had lots of people reach out throughout the state saying our organization is exactly what they're looking for for these grants. So we, we feel very strongly we're gonna, we're gonna get them. 
Finally, while certain aspects of the nonprofit do require continuous community investment, the core of the kitchen operations is projected to be completely self-sustaining by 2027. Even now, all regular kitchen expenses from overhead to utilities are completely supported by the income generated through kitchen ex from the kitchen users. In part, this is definitely due to Culpeper County's support and generosity when it comes to our rent. It's a huge boon that most other community kitchens do not have, and it makes us able to get to the sustainability point much faster. We are lucky that so many organizations have offered to continuously support this project through complementary educational programs and their food rescue work. These partnerships allow us to utilize our income for the operational expenses, which really ensures our sustainability for years to come. On a personal note, I just wanted to say I am very honored to be part of this organization. It's wonderful to be involved in something that really helps the community in such a tangible way. And I really appreciate the support of Culpeper County and thank you all for allowing us to call the Carver Center home. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ledmore. Do we have any questions or comments? Uh, yes, sir. Um, Gretchen, thank you very much. That was a terrific uh, presentation. Uh, the, the program where you'll be hiring some of our, our handicapped young people for full-time employment, has that begun there or that's, that's upcoming? So that's upcoming. We really have to finish the second half of the space. So out of the 6,200 square feet that are allotted for the kitchen, we are using about a third of it, about 2,000. Um, the rest of the kitchen space, which is another 2,000 square feet, is going to be dedicated to that co-packing, mm -hmm. and we need more tables and more equipment. And so what we have done is kept a list of all the graduates of that and continue to engage with them and offered you know, free training and workshops to keep their skills fresh. Um, as soon as we're able to mm -hmm. offer that, we're going we're gonna to hire them. So that's, that's our plan. That's fantastic service. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'd just like to make a comment that there's a lot of talk about what we do to maintain the rural character of Culpeper County. And I think the work that you're doing in the kitchen is a resource that will help us do that. To keep rural, we have to make farms viable. And you are creating a system that will allow farms to get more value from their products, allow small businesses to thrive, and it's a, a great program. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, the bone broth is such an example of that because so many of our cattle producers in this area, bone broth is like, it's, it's very trendy right now. It's very healthy. It's very cool. It's, it's a high value product, right? You're sell, seeing bone broth being sold for like 15, sometimes $20 for a quart jar. And this was a previous waste product. And they're often not able to do anything with their bones unless they ship them really far. Um, so I, I appreciate that because it really, it means a lot to be able to produce something locally that can help so much put money back into the pockets of our farmers. Thank you again. I appreciate the time. Yes, thank you very much. I always enjoy visiting down there, and <laughs> the leaps and bounds you guys have made in six months is amazing. Thank you so much, and keep it up. Thank you. I would just like to piggyback off of Supervisor Durer's comment that it's very encouraging that just about every slide it was farm to farm to school, and you know the farming community was involved, and you know <clears throat> every. Every day I hear of, of another farm that's, that's expanding their farm to table operations and thinking of ways outside of the box to stay you know, viable. And uh, we greatly appreciate it. It's great things going on down there and we thank you for all you're doing. Yeah, so, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item 3.02. The board will discuss and consider approval of a, procl a pro proclamation establishing May 2024 as Older Americans Month. And with this, I'll turn it over to John to introduce this item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This morning, I uh, ask you to consider approval of this proclamation for Older Americans Month 2024. Um, this was brought to us by uh, the folks from Aging Together, and I believe Ms. Phipps is here to receive a copy of this proclamation. Um, but I'd like to read that into the record at this time. Whereas May is Older Americans Month, a time for us to recognize and honor Culpeper County's older adults and their immense influence on every facet of American society. 
and whereas through their wealth and life experience and wisdom, older adults guide our younger generations and carry forward abundant cultural and historical knowledge. And whereas older Americans improve our communities through intergenerational relationships, community service, civic engagement, and many other activities. And whereas communities benefit when people of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds have the opportunity to participate and live independently. And whereas Culpeper County strives to ensure that older Americans have the resources and support needed to stay involved in their communities, now therefore be it resolved that the Culpeper County Board of Supervisors do hereby proclaim May 2024 as Older Americans Month. This year's theme, Powered by Connection, emphasizes the profound impact of meaningful interactions and social connection on the well-being and health of older adults in our community and be it further resolved that the board calls upon the citizens of Culpeper to join in recognizing the contributions of our older citizens and promoting programs and activities that foster connection, inclusion, and support for older adults. Thank you, John. Ms. Phipps, if you'd like to come up, ma'am. Thank you so much. Culpeper is always like the first county to jump on this. We try to do this in all five of our counties and I just really appreciate the support. About a year ago, um, the uh, Surgeon General came out with a report on social isolation. I don't know if any of you had come across it, but it talked about the impact of social isolation, particularly on older adults as being as harmful to health as like smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And so um, loneliness and isolation really does impact physical health and health outcomes. And so I think it's very timely that this year the um, uh, Agency on Aging uh, was proclaiming um, May, uh, the theme for this month as uh, uh, connections, empowered by connections. And at Aging Together, um, that's really what we're all about. In fact, we are hosting, we, we were able to get um, some folks from the state Department of Aging and Rehab Services at the state to host a mini conference this month on social isolation. Guess where? Right here in Culpeper. We're going to be doing that at Pepper's Grill. And we've got uh, not only the state, but a lot of stakeholders that are going to join us and try to brainstorm um, solutions. We, we like to promote, we don't really do the direct services at Aging Together, but we connect older adults with like the Generation Central Adult Day and the senior centers and trying to um, encourage, you know, work with transportation so that older adults can get out and can get to places. And so um, we really do appreciate the support. Uh, five over 50 is uh, a celebration this year and Culpepper will honoring Butch Davis on May 1st. And that's just a great example of highlighting the contributions that older adults make to our community. So I don't want to take up any more of your time, but I really do appreciate this on behalf of everyone at Aging Together. And we appreciate everything you do. Thank you, ma'am. I don't, Nicole, did you want to get a picture? I didn't, yeah. Okay, you got it? <laughs> Okay, the next item that we'll bring up will be the, uh, the board will discuss and consider approval of a proclamation establishing, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the approval of a proclamation recognizing the 250th anniversary of the founding of Culpeper Baptist Church. And again, we'll turn this over to uh, John to introduce this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, second proclamation this morning. <clears throat> this one 
recognizing a, a true milestone in the community, which is the 250 year anniversary of the founding of the Culpeper Baptist Church, and I'd like to read this proclamation into the record. Whereas Culpeper Baptist Church has faithfully operated for 250 years, but dating back to 1774, and whereas the church was composed of members, both black and white, slave, servant, and free, who came together so that they might maintain the order and harmony of a gospel church in observance of their faith. And whereas in the years 1777 and 1778, John Leland served as the pastor of the church and played a decisive role in the formation of the Constitution's religious liberties provisions, recognizing that Baptists generally sought liberty of conscience for all men. And whereas with the revolution impending, the Baptists and their allies began a quest of petitions to the General Assembly for full liberty in religion for all men and its separation from control or support by the state. And whereas in 1833, the church moved into the town of Culpeper, built a new church at East and Davis Streets in 1858, and changed the original name from Mount Pony to Culpeper Baptist Church in 1873. And whereas in 1951, the current church site on West Street in the town of Culpeper was acquired, and in 1955, the first services were held in the education building at that site. And whereas Culpeper Baptist Church has continually recognized needs in its own community, working diligently to serve the residents of Culpeper County from one end of the age spectrum to the other, and whereas the church established a kindergarten program in 1949, which was renamed the Child Development Center, expanded over the years to serve children from infancy through elementary school age, and will celebrate its 75th anniversary later this year. And whereas Culpeper Baptist Church, Pastor J.T. Edwards initiated the creation of the Virginia Baptist Home for the Aged in 1950, today known as the Culpeper. And whereas Culpeper Baptist Church, in partnership with the Culpeper community, dedicated and renovated space within its building to open Generations Central Adult Daycare in May of 2022. And whereas in response to growing Latino population in Culpeper County, Primera Iglesia Bautista Maranatha, the longest serving Hispanic church in Culpeper was founded in 2001 at the Culpeper Baptist Church where it continues to thrive today along with several other churches within the building. And whereas Culpeper Baptist Church seeks to partner with the community by providing meeting space for multiple civic and other organizations throughout the town and county and whereas Culpeper Baptist Church still seeks to impact the community positively and spread the word and love of God, now therefore be it resolved that the Culpeper County Board of Supervisors recognize and honor the Culpeper Baptist Church for its 250 years of long and faithful service to the people of the town and counties of Culpeper. Thank you, John. And I have just noticed that I've gotten ahead of myself from the last proclamation because we didn't call for a motion and a second to approve that proclamation. So um, I don't know the proper protocol. I'll look to our parliamentarian. If, can we go back to the uh, 3.02 and ask for the motion on the first proclamation and a second to approve? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Now we're back to 3.03 .03 for the one for Culpeper Baptist Church. Uh, all those, uh, do we have a motion to approve this proclamation? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 With that said, I would like the historian for Culpeper Baptist Church, Mr. Clatterbuck, to come forward and accept the uh, On behalf of the Culpeper Baptist Church, uh, Reverend Dan Carlton, the Leadership Council, and the 250 Anniversary Committee, we would like to thank you for this proclamation. Uh, when I came in the door in the uh, 
outside here, I noticed a, a map of Culpeper County in 1776 that showed the location of the Mount Pony Church, the original meeting house on that map. There was also another map, a 1763 map of the Davis Street in Culpeper that showed the third location of our church. Uh, and I was just glad to see that in front of the Board of Supervisors room. Um, our church uh, has a tremendous history with it. It's one that uh, we're very proud of. We've recently put a display in the Culpeper Museum. Uh, that display represents religious freedom and Culpeper is the epic center of religious freedom in this country. And uh, I would like to invite you to stop by the uh, Culpeper Museum at some time and take a look at that. And you're also welcome to stop by our Heritage Room at any time and uh, go through the Heritage Room. We have the history of our church uh, displayed on the walls. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Okay, moving on to item 3.04. The board will ratify the declaration for wildfires that was made effective, a declaration of emergency for wildfires that was made effective on Wednesday, March 20th, 2024, and rescinded as of March 21st, 2024. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I ask that this be discussed just because de uh, emergency declarations are serious things, and if they're in my opinion, should be rare, and when done, if at all possible, should be done by the Board of Supervisors. Uh, that's what our EOP says, that's what the state code says, and uh, if it's possible, uh, the Board should be consulted uh, prior to a declaration. So if, if we could do that in the future, uh, I would very much appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I, uh, this is not the first time this has happened. It happened years ago. Once when I was chairman, I declared one. And uh, after the fact, learned that the board had to ratify it. And my, my opinion was that if the board didn't want to ratify it and wanted to change me as chairman, then certainly they had that prerogative. But I think the chairman has to make calls from time to time. And this was an emergency situation. We have an emergency service director that works for the county. But in times of emergency, the chairman of the Board of Supervisors is the overall emergency control if we have something like we had the other day. And in my opinion, he made the right call at the right time for all of the right reasons. And I have all the faith and confidence in his ability to do that job. And I, I don't know why we would question it. I think that. He's there to do what he thinks is in the best interest of the county, and I think he did just that. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, to follow up, uh, according to the state code, it says a local emergency may be declared by the local director of emergency management with the consent of the governing body in the event that the governing body cannot convene uh, due to the disaster. Uh, by the way, I was available to convene or other exigent circumstances, extraordinary that means, uh, it being 4 p.m. on a Wednesday, I don't view as being extraordinary, the director or in his absence, the deputy director, or in the absence of both, any member of the governing body may declare an emergency. So if that's the case, I could have chosen to declare an emergency then, or now, or whenever else, subject to ratification of this board. Uh, in my opinion, I've only been in, uh, yeah. Prior to 2020, I was not involved in any declarations of emergency, but since then, I believe this is the fourth. And the one that was done in April of 2020, I think we did correctly. In that case, the board was contacted. We had discussions, and this was, April of 2020 was a pretty serious time. We were 15 days to slow the spread. And then we all agreed to declare the emergency. So what I'm, I'm commenting on the process, uh, 
as much as anything, and I just think that it would be good, if possible, in the future to see if we can get the opinions of the board uh, prior to declaring the emergency. Thank you, Supervisor Underwood. If I could just um, kind of tell you my mindset behind that. When I received the call on the 20th, and, and let me just, let me back up. For one, I'm not gonna do anything that is gonna undermine the importance of every member who sits on this board. And to give you a timeline, on the 20th, listening to radio traffic, I had contacted Mr. Eggerston earlier that afternoon because of the radio traffic that I'd heard and heard the concern in the voices of our volunteers and first responders. And that being calling everyone that they could possibly get into the office or into the stations to help fight this fire. Later that afternoon, I had heard that Company 2 on uh, Yaywood Lane was completely surrounded in a brush truck with fire. They are having to take the pumpers and run back to town to get water, to get fuel. It was brought to my attention that we need to get a, a, a declaration of emergency. That way we can get outside resources in here. Director Uten had flawlessly jumped on board, gotten chainsaws, blowers, everything we needed. We had tanker trucks bringing water to Boston store. And I will, in, in my mindset then, we didn't have the luxury of time. Time was of the essence versus 2020. Granted, it was a dire situation, but when I'm looking at homes and people's lives that are in danger, that we need to get something up there right now or we're we gonna lose property, that's the reason I did what I did. And I had kind of had gone off of the, um, what the EOP had said, and if the, if, the, if the interpretation was wrong, I will take blame for that, okay? And again, I'm not trying to undermine anybody on this board. Going forward, if we have a chance that we can either do a, a phone call, a consensus of the board, or sit down, but honestly, I thought we were getting ready to lose lives and lose property. And I, you know, again, the, the, the declaration stayed in place no longer than it absolutely had to. And again, I thank each and every one of you guys for what you have done, and you couldn't ask for it to, to turn out any better. So thank you. And That said, I move that we ratify the declaration of emergency that was declared and then ended. Second. second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Moving on to uh, old business, we have none. Item 5.0, new business, we have a 01 that board will consider formally authorizing advertisement of a public hearing to be held April 16th, 2024 at 7 p.m. regarding the proposed FY25 budget and the 730 regarding proposed tax rates. And with this, again, I'll turn it over to our county administrator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so this is the time of year where we ask the board to advertise tax rates and, and the public hearing for the, those tax rates and the budget. Um, <clears throat> on, on board docs was posted the draft budget in its uh, complete form as well as the capital improvements plan draft, uh, the advertisement that was prepared by our finance director uh, for potential uh, publishing to uh, look at a a public hearing on Tuesday, the 16th of April uh, at seven o'clock. So just to sort of summarize the budget and where we are and what the staff is asking for in terms of this advertisement, I have a, a few slides I wanted to run through this morning and I'll try to be, be brief. So uh, as far as the schools go, um, pretty straightforward. We heard uh, at our uh, most recent work session from Dr. Brads and, and, and the, uh, the request from the schools is a, a slight increase over last year, but less than 1%. Uh, and that funding is currently included in its entirety in the proposed budget. Another one of our major uh, budget uh, items, human services. 
this year, the human services budget is flat in terms of its local funding. Um, there are additional state funds and other funds in that budget. Uh, it has increased, but uh, in terms of the local contribution, uh, there is there is no change from from past uh, or from the current fiscal year. In terms of our general county government, we do have some increases. Um, there's a some new position requests, which which uh, some of which were not included in the budget, but the ones you see in this presentation are all baked in there. Uh, there's a full-time HR position, a new position in the Commissioner of Revenues office, uh, a new Registrar's office position, uh, a new criminal justice position for pretrial, and that is not entirely locally funded, but it is partially locally funded. And the judge has asked for an additional law clerk, uh, which is built into the budget. Salary treatments, I think we're all familiar with. There's a 5% cost of living adjustment, as well as the pay for performance increases, which across the board average about 1.5% uh, in addition to that cost of living. Uh, there have been a couple of minor uh, additions on top of that made based on our last work session uh, for the clerk of the court at $8,000 and the commissioner of revenue at uh, just over $15,000. <laughs> And very happily, our health insurance premiums and costs this year are flat, and we're actually even able to look at some uh, improvements to the benefits plan. In terms of public safety, um, the Volunteer Fire and Rescue Association operational budget, which the county covers in its entirety, uh, is about $300,000 higher than the current year. The EMS budget, uh, we have amended uh, per the board's direction. It now includes four new full-time positions rather than the eight that were uh, originally in the draft budget. Uh, there is also a payment plan for uh, new ambulances built within uh, the operational budget of the EMS department. Capital improvements, Mr. McLaren went through with the board uh, the same evening that we talked about the schools. It's about a $9.8 million uh, CIP in terms of what we would take straight out of the general fund that, uh, again, is a pay-as-you-go pay kind of uh, arrangement so that we don't have to have any tax increases or ongoing revenues for those projects. And the middle school is in there, uh, although it doesn't cost us anything this year. Uh, it's a debt service project, and we'll be doing the borrowing and uh, so that is a, a big hit in terms of your total budget number, but not in terms of your tax impact, uh, at least at this point in time. That's a $69 million project. Uh, this is kind of a summary of the total budget, which is, is 300,000, uh, sorry, $300 million this year. Uh, that looks like a huge jump from the 231 million, but that's directly attributable to $69 million for the middle school project. So uh, overall, the budget is, is really not uh, increasing. We had some increases in operational costs and general government, but we had some decreases in CIP and other areas. So in terms of the proposed budget, uh, we do have some increasing revenues that help us out. Um, we have some, some new value from uh, construction, um, which Mr. Underwood had, had brought up at one time. And, and uh, when we looked at the, the budget, um, we had a, a shortfall of some $490,000 still existing. Um, we would have to propose that that be covered by a one cent increase in real estate taxes because of the value of that one cent, which is over 800,000, uh, that, that ends up swinging us about $334,000 to the good side, which uh, we talked about at the last work session, being funds that could be placed uh, in a capital reserve fund, uh, which is already established and has some $6 million in it, which will help in future budgets with your debt service uh, on some of the projects that are coming. And uh, again, as a reminder, a portion of the, that total real estate tax is attributed to a fire and rescue levy. Uh, that levy is simply calculated by adding up the total costs of the volunteer operations 
and the total EMS uh, operational budget. And uh, when you do the math, it equates to eight cents out of the 47 cent proposed real estate tax. So in terms of our public hearing, um, I do recommend that we advertise a, a real estate tax of, of 47 cents, which is a one cent increase. Uh, that's the absolute minimum I would suggest you advertise. I, I know the board knows this, but you, you can change what you advertise uh, downward, but not upward. So it's better to advertise high and, and go back down. Um, but the minimum to cover this proposed budget would be a one cent increase. Just to tell you a little bit about what that one cent would really mean, I, I put together these examples. I won't sit here and read them to you, but uh, on a $250,000 home, that one cent really only equates to $25 a year. On the other hand, a $450,000 home is about a $45 a year increase uh, for that penny. Adding two cents, of course, would double those numbers if the board was so inclined to think about doing that for more future debt coverage. Um, but uh, in terms of the, the recommendation, uh, the total amount uh, of, of real estate requested is 39 cents for general government, eight cents for, for the fire and rescue levy, uh, 47 cents. And that column's kind of out of place there on the far right, but uh, 47 cents is your total on the real estate tax. Vehicle and personal property tax would remain unchanged at $3, and most other personal property taxes would remain unchanged at 350. Uh, there are some different rates for for specialized personal property tax, all of those remain unchanged in the proposed budget. And that's, uh, that's what I have uh, this morning, Mr. Chairman. There's a last slide. I, I won't belabor. I've shown it to you before. It just sort of gives you a regional comparison of our tax rates, and we were able to find proposals for some of our other counties in our region um, and what they're headed for this year. So. We will remain by far the lowest in the region. And uh, just for kicks, I, I did a little bit of research and tried to find the lowest and the highest. And I did find one, Mr. Underwood, of uh, Buchanan County, which is 39 cents. So they, they, they're going to have us beat no matter what. But uh, in any case, what we are seeking today is an authorization to advertise, advertise the proposed budget uh, and the uh, tax rates for a public hearing to be held on April 16th at 7 and at 7.30. By law, we have to have the budget hearing and the tax hearing separate from each other. Thank you, John. Questions or comments for John? Well, I'll just make a comment and I've said it, <clears throat> said it before that I think the board over the years has done an amazing job with keeping the tax rate low. And I'm proud of that since I've been on the board and I know Supervisor Rosenberg has been on the board a long time and he's been involved with that for a long time and many of the other past board members as well. Um, and I think we've only planned for the future. I think it's, I think it's, we've done a great job of planning for the future going forward, even though we have $100 million or a little over $100 million we're going to have to spend in the schools with economic development projects. So very proud of where we are, and I think this chart with the rest of Virginia says it all. Mr. Chairman, I would say that I agree with Mr. Deal's sentiments relative to uh, how we've progressed relative to the tax rates. Uh, seeing Buchanan, though, there is more progress we can be made that we can make. So it would be great to get down below 39 cents and $1.95 for the car tax. Uh, I think that we hopefully will have the opportunity to do so in future years. But for this year, uh, 47 cents is where I believe we need to advertise the real estate tax rate in keeping with staff's recommendation. So I'll make a motion that we uh, advertise as staff recommended with the 47. So we have a motion and a second on the floor. 
Any other comments or questions? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. Um, before we move on to our next item on the agenda, I just want to quick just put a blurb out to our Director of Finance and all the staff for all the work that you have done. Um, I meant to say something last month with the uh, audit that we had and the, and the excellent rating and, you know, the entire staff. You guys have done a great job, and I, I, there's times I really wouldn't want your, what you have to do, but uh, we thank you immensely for what you've done. <clears throat> Moving on to item 5.0. Two, the board will discuss and consider approval of the FY25, FY30 six-year secondary construction plan. And with that, we will turn it over to our director of planning, Mr. McLaren, to introduce this item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good member, morning, uh, members of the board. Each time this year, the board is uh, asked to review uh, the secondary six-year road plan. Um, so fiscal is a six-year plan. Um, each year, primarily the funds are used uh, to hard surface gravel roads throughout the county, of which we still have plenty. Um, we have about 494 miles of secondary roads throughout the county that are maintained by the state. A little less than 100 now um, are unpaved still uh, to date. In your current plan, this current fiscal uh, year, 24 to 29, there's just under 14 miles on that plan to be hard surfaced. That list below there are the current roads that are on the plan. Some are in the process now, um, and hopefully 626, 721, 1162 will all receive their hard surface in this year. They're a little behind, uh, but they should receive it this year. And then we'll move on to Old Still House and then further on through that list. Last year, uh, the board did add uh, 624, uh, which is Sheets Mountain Road. Just kind of shares uh, the, the funding that's involved uh, with this program. Uh, the estimated uh, available funds over the next six years, uh, and this is given to us by the state, by VDOT, um, is a little better than four and a half million dollars. And just a way of average hard surfacing, and this is a tar and chip product, most typically for some of our gravel roads, it averages anywhere between 500,000 to 850,000 per mile to even a half a mile, actually. That's why it takes a little bit of time. Each year, the board's adopted or asked to adopt a six-year secondary road plan. Normally, we would have a public hearing. I'm going to share uh, why staff is recommending a little bit different process this year. Uh, we work with VDOT, uh, continue to review potential roads, um, and that really comes down to the following there, the last little bit there, the funding that's available each year or each six years. Uh, the traffic counts for the roads. Uh, the board has taken a, a step recently to kind of prioritize based on traffic counts. Uh, the location citizen requests, which we get continually, VDOT as well as the county. And of course, VDOT has their own maintenance considerations that we consider as well. Sheets Mountain Road, also we added uh, Hazel River Road and Glenella last year. Those are out year projects, so they're you know, still probably four or five years away uh, than the current plan. Um, the staff proposes no changes to those, but they will move slowly up through the cycle. This year, VDOT provided updated cost estimates for the existing projects, not the ones that are going to be done this year, but for those out-year projects. And there was a, quite a bit of increase based on contracts from last year and this year uh, to help basically keep those projects in order. Um, and that was an order of about 935000 additional dollars when they went back and reviewed those current projects that are in the plan. Those remaining projects can't be completed without the additional funding based on the increased contract estimates that VDOT's received. Uh, the proposed draft plan um, that we've showed here on board docs um, applies those revenues over the next six years to the existing projects in order to maintain their schedules so they don't get delayed. Um, that being said, that with the due additional money projects coming off the list, uh, there was a little less than $100,000 uh, that would go towards the countywide services line. Uh, VDOT uses that line item for speed and safety studies, uh, which the board you all are familiar with, we do ask from time to time. Unfortunately, based on the increase of the current projects, um, 
staff has recommended that the board adopt the posted draft plan, which was on board docs with addition of, unfortunately, no new roads this cycle. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to leave it at that. I wish I had better news um, as far as the funding um, and as far as uh, moving those projects through, but I think in staff's opinion, that's the best move to make is to, is to apply those new funds over the six year to the current project so that they don't jump out of line or move beyond the six year time horizon. And because of that, there really is not enough money in the next six years under the current proposal uh, to really add any new roads. As I mentioned, we know that there's about 100 miles left to go, but there, there's just not funding in this program right now. Thank you, Sam. <clears throat> Questions or comments for Sam? Just a comment that I'd like to thank staff for their work. This isn't good news, but it was brought before Public Works. We looked at it, and frankly, there, there is inflation. There's no doubt about it. And to add another road when the money isn't there wouldn't make sense. So to set expectations that couldn't be fulfilled is not the right way to go. So we supported staff uh, with having a no new roads added for the secondary six-year plan this time. Any other comments? Or we'll entertain. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. We'll entertain a motion. I move that we approve the 2025 to 2030 six-year secondary construction plan. Motion and a second. Further discussion? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries. Moving on to item 5.03, and this will be a discussion to approve a resolution in support of three community funding requests. And with this, I'll turn it over to our county administrator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, each year for the last several years, we've had an opportunity to request some federal funding for community projects through Representative Spamberger's office. Uh, we've been successful uh, twice now. A couple of projects that were just awarded that I'll, I'll be speaking to in my uh, administrator's report. But uh, in any case, the way these come about, uh, there's generally a guidance meeting held that tells us what types of projects will, will score the strongest, which ones might be selected by the representative's office to include and uh, go forward. And um, that, that guidance meeting has not yet occurred, but what we have been told is that it's going to occur any day, and once it does, the turnaround time will be very short, uh, as in probably a week or less. So. Um, we did talk uh, a little bit about this, this program and some potential projects um, at, a, at a committee meeting, um, but just didn't know whether this was going to be ready for the board or not. Uh, in all honesty, it, it, it doesn't seem like it's quite ready for prime time, but then again, we're not going to have time to wait until May. So uh, Laura Loveday is prepared these resolutions for three projects that we think might fall within the guidelines and ultimately uh, we'll submit them and, and some will, will make it into the, the budget proposal hopefully and, and some may not. But the three that, that we conceived of that we think will meet the guidelines best are the construction uh, costs for the Sims Drive extension, which is the road from Friendship Way uh, to the Pearl Sample AG Elementary campus because that one's shovel ready. Um, Laura thinks it'll have a good chance. Uh, the other is uh, for uh, improvements to our uh, safety communication center. We do have some, some CIP plans for improving the dispatch center and expanding it and we thought that might qualify for funds and the last is for some additional work at the Carver Center where we've been successful now twice before. So I'm gonna ask Laura to come up and hopefully I've covered most of this, but if there's questions, she's gonna be the right one to answer them. And we are seeking approval uh, of all three resolutions to include in our package that we submit, which hopefully will be within the next couple of weeks. Yes, 
Um, and I apologize, we, we thought we would have that guidance by now, but we do not. Um, and I will say this is the fourth year we have the opportunity to apply for these funds, and we have received funding for four projects in the previous three years, so we've been very successful so far. Um, in addition to what John said at the Rules Committee, we also mentioned um, entrance improvements at Carver, which initially we thought there wouldn't be enough time as those preliminary engineering uh, and estimates are being prepared currently to get those project, that project in this year. It's possible now that those guidance um, documents haven't been released yet that we might be able to get that in as a, a fourth project. So I wrote the resolution for Carver very general. It could be used for either. Comments? No, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we approve all three of our community funding requests. Second. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. Thank you, Laura. With that, we will move on to item 6.0, our committee reports. And first report is our public works committee, and we'll turn this over to Supervisor Underwood. Uh, yes, sir. The committee brings forward a motion that the board authorize the advertisement of a public hearing to consider proposed changes to the water and sewer uh, fee rate structure and a 10% increase in those fees. Second. I would note that that'll be the first increase in more than a decade. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Moving on to building and grounds. I'll turn this over to Supervisor Durr. No action items, Mr. Chairman. Rules Committee, Supervisor Gugino. The committee brings forward a motion that the board refer the proposed amendments to Article 8B of the Zoning Ordinance, PUD, to the Planning Commission for consi further consideration. Motion and a second. Further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 B, the committee brings forward with no recommendation the consideration of consolidation of some or all of the commercial zoning districts in the zoning ordinance. Mr. Chairman, that this one came forward as, as uh, Supervisor Gugino indicated with no recommendation, so uh, presumably you may want to hear from Mr. McLaren. If we could, Sam, if you want to come up and uh, introduce this. Morning again. So staff did look at uh, potential consolidation of com or, or existing commercial zoning districts with the rules committee. Um, staff's uh, opinion is that I, I don't know that it's a, a real value uh, to our existing commercial zoning districts or the county in general or the zoning ordinance in general. Um, staff's position, we have three different uh, districts today. You see on the screen there are convenience center, village center, and commercial services. Uh, most of our properties fit in the commercial services category, but we do have some in each category, um, and, and each of those parcels were, were posted for the, on board docs uh, so you could see where, where they were and, and how many parcels there are throughout the county. They each do allow for a little bit different uses um, in each of the different districts. CS kind of piggybacks off the smaller two, CC and VC, so you can do pretty much anything in the CS as far as commercial. Um, Staff just didn't see any real value in, in necessarily consolidating. We went through a consolidation um, effort. We actually have, I think, six different commercial zoning districts, uh, probably about a decade or better ago, um, and we did consolidate into the three that we have today and uh, have been running with for some time. Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to answer any further questions um, or do further work um, if desired by the board on this. So. Questions or comments for Sam? Or a recommendation, motion. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Hearing none, or 
just leave it as it is? Is that what we're looking at? Okay. All right, C, the committee brings forward a recommendation that the board advertise for a public hearing an amendment to county code chapter nine, miscellaneous offenses and provisions, article one. The amendment addresses the requirement for vehicles to be loaded securely to prevent items and trash from escaping the vehicle. Second. Discussion? It's briefly, what, from what I understand, this would kind of mirror the state code and allow our local law enforcement to enforce uh, relative to trash and how the vehicles are secured. I believe this is needed. I get more calls regarding trash than almost anything, although I'm glad to see that we are seeing some volunteers out there and things improving recently, but uh, this is needed, so thank you. I agree with you, Supervisor Underwood, but I also think that we're, you know, the, and I commend the, uh, um, Commonwealth Attorney's Office, uh, Joe Koontz with Criminal Justice Options for all the, you know, the ones that are out there picking up the trash, but I think we really need to look at the, instead of solutions to get the trash picked up, look at a way that we can prevent the trash from being put out there in the first place. So um, I think this will be a, one of the steps needed to uh, get to that point. So any other discussion? And do we have a motion and a second? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries unanimous. <clears throat> Moving on to our joint school county capital planning committee. With this, I'll turn it over to Supervisor Durr, if you don't mind, to um, introduce this item. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the joint uh, capital planning committee, which is made up of Chairman Bates, Myself, two members of the school board have been meeting for probably close to a year now to talk about what we need to do relative to our schools and expanding and building some new schools, improving the ones that we have. We've heard extensive or we have seen extensive research as to where students are located, how the schools are populated and how we best fit everyone in. So I'd like to turn it over to uh, Superintendent Brads. Do you have a presentation? No. no, no I thought there was a presentation here, but there is not. Excuse me. So the committee has met. We have seen extensive research that talks about where the schools should be. We looked at two sites specifically one at Clevenger's Corner, and this was land that was proffered by the developers a number of years ago. And we have looked at another site in the Greens Corner area. When you consider all of the, uh, the location of the students and the way that we would divide up the student population, it makes sense that the new elementary school would be built in the Greens Corner area. So the committee brings forward a recommendation to the board that we uh, authorize staff to begin looking at purchasing property in the Greens Corner area for the construction of a new elementary school. Second. All right, well, we have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Um, John, did you have a comment? I, I was just gonna say that you know, we, we did uh, spent a great deal of time, as, as Supervisor Durr indicated, in, in looking at, at data and uh, looked at everything from student populations in current schools to bus routes and seeking really to relieve the pressure on those schools that exist today. And, and uh, Greens Corner did come out uh, on top as far as the committee was concerned. So I won't, I won't <laughs> belabor the point, but there is a presentation that has a lot of that data in it for your review at your convenience. Chairman, I do have one comment. I am grateful to see that we are pushing further east for an elementary school, Richardsville. Every time I go down there, there's another cul-de-sac with 15 to 20 houses. And despite not having issued subdivisions, I believe that, that we are gonna see a lot more growth in the Lignum to Richardsville area. And this will alleviate those two hour bus trips that those elementary school kids have to take. And I'm very grateful that the data supported what 
Stevensburg has been pushing for a really, really long time, and that's an elementary school in their district. The other thing I would note is uh, I appreciate the work that the Joint Capital Committee has done, but it's clear that we need another elementary school. Uh, when you look at how the, the, popu the school age population is growing, uh, and you look at current capacity, capacity utilization with most well above 90%, uh, we need one in the next three to five years. And to do that, we got to get moving now. So uh, appreciate the work everyone's put into this. I would just like to say that um, based off of, of, of John's point, the, the data is on board docs. And if you look at the impact of the other schools, elementary, middle, and high school, that is affected where you put this new school. You know, I had no idea. And again, I just want to say thank you to everybody for the amount of data that was that was put together, the collaborative effort between the two bodies to have open discussion and you know look at the facts on you know what's going to be best suited for the for the students. Um, I think it was a great outcome and and. Again, I, I'm, I'm pleased to say that uh, I think we've made the right choice uh, going forward. So um, that said, we have a motion and a second. If there's no further discussion on this topic, I'll ask all those in favor to signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And that's unanimous, Ms. Ellis. With that, we will now move over to item 7.0, our administrator's report. And again, we will turn this over to our county administrator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just three quick items of, of all uh, happy news this morning, I think. Um, first, uh, we did receive uh, word that uh, some federal funding has been signed into law that will be bringing some money to Culpeper County for Lynn Park and for the Carver Center. That's $132,777 for uh, Lynn Park uh, to uh, bring some trails up to ADA standards and, and make some improvements there at Lynn. And uh, a full $500,000 for uh, further improvements at the Carver Center, this time to address the auditorium uh, in that building. So uh, these are the funds that you passed the resolutions for uh, just a, a few minutes ago that were added to the agenda. And uh, as I said, we've been successful in, in uh, getting these funds thanks to Ms. Loveday. So uh, this is uh, another 600 plus thousand dollars in, in the coffers for county projects. Uh, secondly, I wanted to just uh, let you all know that uh, our deputy clerk was uh, awarded a scholarship to attend uh, a clerk's conference and she's gonna get to go all the way to Canada. So uh, she was one of very few people to get that scholarship. And uh, while I, I probably would have been happy to pay for her to go, this, this makes it a whole lot easier to give her a couple days away. So good job, Kim. Uh, and lastly, uh, you might have noticed there's no, uh, no economic development director's report this morning. Brian is out of office, but uh, I did wanna, uh, recognize him for successfully earning his certified economic developer credential from the International Economic Development Council. Uh, Brian's been working hard towards that and uh, passed his uh, rather rigorous test and interview panel uh, just a couple weeks ago. So congrats to Brian. And that's all I have. Thank you, John. Any comments? Moving on, we will entertain a motion to go into closed session. Mr. Chairman, I move that we enter into closed meeting as permitted under Virginia Code Annotated Section 2.2-3711A13 3, 4, 6, 8, and 29. Two, one, receive legal advice regarding the potential options, limitations, and liability considerations as to the legal structuring of a jail facility as detailed in the Code of Virginia, the Virginia Administrative Code and other applicable law, and to discuss and consider the acquisition of real property, a jail facility, 
the award of a public contract and the investment of public funds therein, where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the financial interest, bargaining position, and or negotiating strategy of the board if made public initially. Two, to discuss and consider assignment, appointment, performance salary, and or resignation of an identifiable, <clears throat> identifiable employee of the county, and number three, to discuss and consider a citizen's, citizen's appointment to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 We are now in closed session.